So welcome everybody to today's Compute Seminar. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Björn Newstead. And Björn is visiting us from the SciLife Lab. He's based in Uppsala. And he's going to talk to us about the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure, Sweden. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be in Lund again. Uh, I'm trying to be here occasionally. Um, I will talk about, uh, this is a bit of a tricky talk to me. I don't know who you are, so I don't know how to frame it. I, I assume that you don't know so much about biology, perhaps. more. So I'm going to talk about biology and genomics in particular from a data perspective and telling what's happening in this field or has been happening and is happening. Uh, as Manuel said, I'm from Synaf Lab uh, and I'm from in particular one of the platforms at Synaf Lab, which is the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure Infrastructure. To Sweden. And what is Synaf Lab? Synaf Lab is, according to the, to the government, one of the three major infrastructures in Sweden. There are two in Lund, Max 4 and ESS. You need to build a tram to get there, I understand. Uh, and Synaf Lab is very different in terms of being an infrastructure in that. So these are huge constructions that you plan for 10 years and you build for 10 years and you use for 30, 40 years. I don't know. Whereas Synaf Lab has an extremely high turnover of the machine park. So things get outdated very quickly. So the machines we buy now, we could use for one or two, three years perhaps, and then they're old. So there's been a tremendous development in omics. And this is the, I mean, the community that we serve. We also spread out over Sweden. So we have nodes in Lund and Umeå, also Gothenburg, uh, Linköping. So, so Science Lab is primarily located in Stockholm, Uppsala, but has also nodes at other sites. Um, it has a dual role, it's important to understand. So Synaf Lab has, is, has its national service role, which is very clear and defined. I'm part of that. It has also a local scientific center role, so this is sort of a faculty. This is very unclear still, I would say, after eight years of operations. We still don't really know who's faculty at Synaf Lab. <laughs> if you have any ideas, tell us. Uh, but, uh, but over the years, this part has been... Um, shaped up, I would say. So this is supposed to be now the Swiss Army knife for Swedish life science researchers. And last year we served more than 1,500 unique users through these platforms. And that's quite an impressive number, I must say. Uh, so it's not a single thing serving a single small community, but it's really a broad, broadly used uh, array of platforms. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about money. So this is nicked numbers from VR's homepage, I think. So uh, just to give you some sort of feeling for the size. So this is Silaf Lab sort of funding in, here in green. And then you add on the blue bits are, are sort of money from, from, from VR infrastructure money. Uh, and you can compare that to the, to the staples for the ESS and Max 4 and CERN, for example. So infrastructure traditionally has been these uh, large physics uh, um, accelerators, basically. Uh, but we are moving over and also seeing that there is a strong need for infrastructure also for life sciences. And I think this is acknowledged now by, also by VR. Okay, so I'm going to be very basic with you in the beginning. Uh, for some of you, this is going to be boring, but, but uh, stay with me. I mean, you're still getting paid to be here, right? So it's okay. Uh, DNA. Let's talk about DNA for a minute. So DNA is analog information about how to run and maintain an organism. Okay. So DNA is packed inside the cells uh, in certain structures, and then that is translated into what we call RNA molecules, and the RNA molecules in turn code for proteins. Why nature did it this complex, I still don't know, but this is how it works. And the proteins are the things that really do things in the body. And so they can construct, so they can be very different, and they form structures that are entirely different. So they can be muscles or hormones. Uh, they can uh, act for transportation. So they, they can have so many different roles. Um, but this is what it looks like. About 2% of the human genome code for proteins. Uh, and the rest is there, and there's been an ongoing debate for I don't know how long, but if it's the rest is just junk. And there are papers lately saying that uh, maybe 80% of the genome seems to be functional in some sense, and maybe the rest are, is junk and so on. I don't have an answer to that. But it's interesting to see that there's a lot of information that we have a 
vague understanding of what it does still. Okay, so how much DNA do we have in a human cell? So here I'm in, in the astrology building, uh, we need to talk about astrology, right? So how much DNA do we have in a cell? Anybody? How long is it? Two centimeters. No, it's two meters. Two meters. Oh. So it's two meters in a cell, so it's about my height. So this is how much DNA there is in, in one cell. And there's more than one cell in a body, so how much DNA do we have in a body, right? Anybody? It's a lot of cells. Hmm? Uh, pretty good, yeah. So it's from the Earth to the Moon and back 50,000 times. This is how much DNA you have in your body, right? So there's a lot of DNA. If you take the body regenerates cells also, so you don't have the same set up of cells now as you did when you were born. So you regenerate cells all the time. So you have to regenerate DNA. So how much DNA do you regenerate throughout the lifetime? Then the scale is now from the sun to the next star and you almost get there. And that was one individual. That's a lot of DNA. Okay. So what is DNA? So in a human genome, then in one cell, there are 3.2 billion DNA base pairs, we call them. So they are formed this DNA helixes, and there are four bases. So computers are based on oh, only one and zero. That's binary. Nature, for some reason, chose to have four letters. Uh, what we do, typically in genome, genome sequencing, genome, genome analysis, is to cut it up. So we would like to know everything here. But for technical reasons, we have to cut it up in small pieces. And we call those small pieces a read. Okay, so a read is a small piece of DNA. It could be 50 base pairs, it could be longer. Okay? Uh, and for a sample, if we analyze a human being, for example, and we want to, we take them into the clinic, we, we analyze their genome, uh, then we do a few hundred millions of those small pieces that comes out of the sequencing machine. So that's a sample for us. Okay, so what do we do with these? So one thing that we could typically do, which is computational, is that we can have a typical genome that somebody made for us some, somewhere, and so this is a typical human, and then we can take those reads and we mash them up. This is what we call alignment. So then you can see, okay, so this read seems to come from this part of the prototypical human genome, okay? Uh, and we can do interesting, then we can do, start to do interesting things with that. So uh, if we have a lot of these from the same individual, basically representing a number of cells, assuming these cells are identical, then we can see, okay, so here at this position, uh, there seems to be a different code compared to the typ prototypical sort of human being. So this is, a, this is a point mutation. So something differs between me and the prototypical human or between my cancer cells and my normal cells. Okay, so we have here, for example, SORIC, which is one of the one of the workflows we built to identify point mutations between cancer cells and the normal cells in the body. Um, so that we can do. What? How is it done in the lab? So this is uh, this is a robot. Every little there are eight needles here in this robot. So each of those contain liquid, and that that is a sample from an individual. So we take cells, some sort of maybe blood cells, we put them in liquid and then they're handled by robots. Uh, they're put on the glass slide, these samples. Uh, and now they are also chemically processed before, so we can tax, we can take a lot of these samples and put them, them on the same glass slide and backtrack where they came from, what individual they came from. Uh, we put the glass slides in a, in a sledge, we put the sledge into a machine, these, these are the typical machines we work with. And inside the machines, we split up the DNA. So we, ma we make them single-stranded. So DNA is double-stranded, if you remember. Uh, and then we flood these single-stranded with nucleotides. Nucleotides are these ATCG. And they are fluorescent, uh, sort of fluorescent dyes put on each of these, each, each of the nucleotides. And so for each of the rounds of floods, we take a picture. And then we know what nucleotide was incorporated, and by that we can know the order of sequences for this uh, piece of DNA that we put here. And from the top then, the interesting thing is that here we see it from, from the top, so each of the dots 
is a piece of DNA, and you see the fluorophore label for each dot, so we know exactly which, uh, which, uh, which, which of the nucleotides were put for each, each dot, and then we flood it over and over again and do a photo every time, and thereby we deduce the sequence. And the interesting thing is that the technological development here has uh, sort of made it possible to do, I think we're up to 10 billion clusters now at each glass slide. So now you do this in parallel 10 billion times on a glass slide like this. Uh, which means that we, you will get a data file out that looks like this, so you have some information up here about the identity of the cluster that you're looking at or the, or the DNA molecule, and then you get the sequence. And then down here you have a quality value also. So you have a sequence and for each position in the sequence, this is just, it looks weird, but it's just a coded quality. So the uh, single character code for, uh, for, 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 for the probability that we are correct in thinking that uh, it's a G here at the first position. So here's one read, here comes the next read, and then you have 10 billions of those in the file. That's the output we get from a sequencing machine. So a read then is just a tiny bit of information or information about a tiny fraction of, of a genome. Okay, so why is, would anybody care about this? Uh, and just to start saying that somebody does care, so CERN, some people from maybe from, from the physics department here, I mean CERN was this huge initiative uh, in science uh, to build CERN cost of $5 billion. Uh, the company who's producing the sequencing machines I just showed you, I checked yesterday and they have a market value of nine CERNs. So you can build CERN nine times over for the market value of Illumina. And that is not a drug company, they are just producing sequencing machines and the chemicals for those machines. It's pretty amazing. Um, and the development of this has been tremendous. So this is interesting also. So in 2000 and 2000 or 2001, the first human genome was published and, and that was a huge effort. It took many years and lots of labs contributed to that. And this was sort of, oh, now we're done. But actually nothing had really started. And interestingly, nothing happened for many years. So here it is like nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened, boom, 2009 it happened. And since then, we've had a logarithmic increase of sequencing production in the world. So here's a log scale on this axis. And as you can see, we're now, we're kind of passing petabyte scale in storage now. And we're in five or 10 years, we're gonna be at zettabytes. And zettabyte is, is a lot of data for almost any field in research. Uh, and there are these large initiatives. Now we're gonna have a million human genomes available for research within EU by 2022. It's been it's like a mission statement saying that. So Projects now where we're going to sequence all the vertebrates on the planet. It's about 60, 70,000 species. And then you're going to do population genomics of those. Uh, so this is a fantastic technological development, almost not rivaled by anything. And the blue line here is Moore's law. So as you can see, we're much faster than the computer development. And people are then arguing or trying to argue that maybe genomics is not gonna just be big data, but perhaps it's gonna be the biggest data field in a decade from now. Uh, and we'll see about that, but th there are some, some indications that this could become super, super big. And it's a little bit hidden now because it's really distributed because all these machines are not very big, right? It's not a certain machine that you buy, but there's lots of them and they're spread out all over. It's also, I think it's worth to point out that one of the challenges here is not only the volume, but the heterogeneity also. So it's not only one type of sequencing, it could prepare the libraries in smart ways. So it's really, you can produce a lot of different types of data with basically the same technology. Uh, and also you can pose a lot of research questions. Again, 1500 different researchers used our services last year. It's an indication that this is not just a, like a narrow field for some, some research questions, but there's a lot of things that can be answered. Um, Yes, and just again on volume, the first human genome took 13 years. Uh, 2016, Sinoflab produced the human genome every fourth minute. It gives you an idea about the technology development in this time. So 
this is really basic, but there are three things that comes back and bites us all the time when we're working with, I mean, with data, and that's computationally interesting then. So why, because in principle, you can buy a big computer and you could process the data and that's fine, you know? You don't really need so many skills. But some things that are tricky for real is this. Okay, so you get things out of the machine that looks kind of similar. These are almost identical, but not quite. And then that could be due to three different reasons, essentially. Uh, one is they come from two different places in the genome, which are almost identical. They could also be completely identical, which makes it even worse. So these things happen all the time. We have lots of parts of the genome that repeats itself. And I'm not going to go into any biological function of those repeats, but from a mathematical perspective, we can just treat them as repeats. And that's tricky for the computers because they get confused. So it could be that. Also, as you might know, you have one chromosome from your mother inherited from your mother, one from your father. It means you have basically repeats of everything in your genome because you have two copies. And those are, for the most part, they're actually identical. Your mom and dad are not so dissimilar as, as, as you might think. Uh, but at some parts, they actually differ. So these two that look different could be from the same parts of the genome, just from the two different chromosomes. And how would a computer know now if it's a repeat or if it's a heterozygous site? And the third thing is that the sequencing machines do errors. Okay, so these two could actually be from the same chromosome, the same site, but then the sequencing machine did some, something wrong and, and gave us an error. So now you have these three different scenarios, which makes your life super complicated instead of being very easy. Okay, so that was short on that. Uh, not gonna talk so much about that, but just a little bit about the development. So the latest wave of sequencing applications, for example, is single cell RNA. So now we're looking at the activity of genes and not only genes in general, but in a certain cell. So we can actually take one single cell and we can read out the gene activity of that cell and compare it to the gene activity of other cells. And you get these nice clusters and we're doing pseudo time development through these clusters and you can do time series and you can understand uh, embryo embryonic development and whatnot. So, so this is a super hot field, uh, papers coming out in science and nature all the time on this. Um, and to put it one step further, we can also place it back to a spatial site so you can take a, uh, um, so here is a bit of tissue, you slice a tissue uh, and put it on the glass slide and on the glass slide are certain dots uh, and each dot, for each of these small dots, you can make a full-fledged transcriptomics analysis. So now instead of looking at the gene expression of a whole tissue, you can put, you can check the gene expression of this little dot compared to that little dot compared to that little dot. And then you can combine that with a single cell analysis and you can do really interesting inferences about how tissues work. So not only how do cells work, but how does the tissue work? Okay, as a community, we quickly, as you see, this tremendous technological development uh, made us end up here. So as data was getting super cheap and super easy to produce, uh, people were suddenly we're using all the money as they used to to produce data because that used to be the hard part. Uh, and suddenly as a community, we sat with a lot of data, but the lack of competence in computing. So how do we treat this data? How do we, uh, because there's lots of small details that you need to be careful about in these analyses. Um, so one of the ways that we addressed that at Scilab Lab was to say, okay, we have all these nice data producing platforms. But let's also start a bioinformatics platform. And this platform where Ben Persson is the director, uh, we don't produce any data. So our role is basically to, uh, to increase knowledge of bioinformatics in the research community. That's our role. We interact closely with SNCC, for example, for, for hardware. So we don't own any hardware. We basically only sit on competence. Uh, so that's, that's only people in that, in that platform. Uh, and it's not only us, this is global, of course. It's not only Sweden in a sense, but then this was sneaked from, from a small article, opinion article a few years back saying that institutions and funding bodies has to carve out a viable place for bioinformatics who focus on collaborations at the universities. 
And so this is what we have done, I think, and, and is trying to do. And we do that by offering a critical mass for people. It's no good if people are too dispersed and have nobody to talk to. Uh, we can offer permanent positions at the university for, for this uh, expert tracks. Um, we can let them focus on technical issues and on the knowledge sharing. So basically we are creating a track aside from the PI track and saying, okay, maybe the university actually needs core experts in this area that don't have to be PIs. Uh, and we, we also uh, have been very uh, clear from the beginning that we need clear priority models. And so, okay, if we have these people, who sh how should we interact with the user community? Uh, and we think this, this, these technologies are important for all sorts of different research, everything from health and aging over to environment and, and ecology and evolution, origin of life, whatnot. So we're gonna be important for a lot of areas. So we do this uh, at the Bioinformatics platform, not through one thing, but we try to do multiple uh, things, so essentially creating a sort of ecosystem around scientists. And we're not replacing scientists, of course, and the research groups, but we're complementing them. So one thing we do is to think about future compute environments. So what should your compute, computers look like two or five years from now? in order to serve the life science community in a good way. We do a lot of consultations. So once you've started to think about your product, uh, maybe you're, you're very good at uh, uh, I mean building houses, but now you have this idea that you want to build a house on the rocks. Uh, and we have a lot of sort of knowledge on rock climbing. So you can come to us and we can talk about it. So we have people to design their experiments. We, um, uh, we are not, as I said, that we don't own the hardware, but we produce a lot of, or, or we host a lot of software on these compute, central compute clusters. So, so last year there was about 800 different bioinformatics products running on these central computer clusters. Uh, and we have installed now about 200 different softwares that are ready to go on those clusters. So as, as a user, you don't need to sit and install a lot of things yourself. Almost everything is already there. We do a lot of training events, uh, which are pure training then, so courses and workshops uh, where we, uh, and so these are typically two to five days courses uh, where we have about 500 postdocs a year or so taking these courses. We engage in research projects, so um, uh, through different tracks, then, then we can engage and perform analysis hands-on in different research projects. And per year, we're sort of hands-on involved more or less in, in about 200 projects. So that's quite substantial. Uh, we do, to some extent, tools development. If we see that people, I mean, normally people want to do different things. That's what research is, right? You don't want to do what everybody did before. But sometimes there are parts that people want to do over and over. And then we can invest some time in trying to, to do some tools that could take you there over and over. Uh, and then we're, of course, also very keen to see data being used and reused. So we're helping with data publishing also in open science. And again, open science is not the philosophy, it's technology, right? If the technology is there, the researchers will use it. When it comes to, to support for projects, we have two tracks that is this now. So you can either pay per hour, and this has traditionally been uh, more for shorter projects. So basically you can come to us, you send an email and within a week or two, we will uh, get back to you, discuss your project, and assign an expert to your, to your study. Uh, and then you pay per hour. Um, we have another track, so funded by the Wallenberg Foundation. It's what we call the long-term term, term team, uh, where we engage in, uh, to, to a large extent. But then we, don't have, we cannot take so many projects. So then we have a peer review system. So again, you need to be clear about the priority model. So there are, there's an external peer review that ranks the product uh, uh, applicants. Um, and these projects we, we typically follow for one or two or sometimes three years. So that's a substantial amount of uh, engagement. Yes, and everything this is on our homepage, of course. You just go into mbis.se and you click support and you will get everything explained. Or you can just contact us and talk to us at any time. 
just going to show that of our ongoing research projects, so again, a little bit of flavor for the diversity. I think I counted, so for my team, uh, the first four years we worked on uh, 30 different species and 20 different data types. That's sort of the diversity it has. And if you take a list from our homepage here, so the first one is about uh, gene expression in the, in the nucleus compared to the cytosol, so in the nucleus and in the rest of the cell, in brain cells. The next is about virus defense systems in bacteria in the Baltic Sea. The third one is chromatin inheritance. I'm not even sure what that is about. Uh, here's the cancer project. Uh, here's decoding the birth of hair follicles by single cell RNA. So understanding how hair is formed by using single cell technologies. Uh, this is diabetes, uh, looking at uh, uh, epigenetic modifications to the DNA. Here's the diseases in human history. This is about taking bones from the ground from ancient people and then by trying to figure out what, uh, then we sequence bacterial sequence in there to infer what bacterial infections those prehistorical humans had. Okay, so just a flavor of the different types of things we do with the same team of people. And, and we're uh, now, uh, at the platform, I think we're, we're active in about 100 projects at any given time. Yes, so I want to mention our hands-on workshops I just said. We have about 30 of those every year. There's a PhD mentoring program also, so PhD students can get a mentor for two years, uh, where we meet with the PhD students every month, and then we have two big meetings every year where everybody gets together. Uh, this has been very popular. Uh, I'm starting getting emails now when this will open, because it says on the homepage November, and the answer is as soon as I have time to open the application. <laughs> but it will come. <laughs> uh, so keep an eye out now. So, so we have, again, open applications every year. So trying to be transparent here. Um, uh, we do summer camps. So this is something we started this year, actually, in the summer. So this is advanced bioinformatics in R, uh, two-week summer camp over at Gotland. It was super nice. Uh, some people were there. Uh, then we do some tools development. Uh, sorry, I mentioned for, for cancer genomes. We hunt with this Swedish genome. So that's 1,000 Swedish individuals that were sequenced a couple of years ago. And this is now online. So you can get the frequency of, of the SNPs or, or the mutations for, uh, for the Swedish population. That's downloadable from the homepage. Uh, and then some other spin-off tools we have. I want to mention Elixir. So the bioinformatics platform is also hooked up to the European infrastructure for bioinformatics. This primarily deals with more traditional bioinformatics uh, infrastructure in terms of databases, interoperability between databases. So for example, the, hum uh, like the human protein atlas that has been developed in Sweden. How does that talk to SwissProt, which is one of the major databases in biology and so on. Uh, it's also a lot of capacity building and training involved here, so that's part of that. Um, and I should mention also, we also as a team work a lot on reproducible research. So this is an issue with all these large, as, lo data, as the data sets are getting larger and more complex, uh, keeping track of what you actually have done to the data turns out to be a, a challenge. Uh, and we are trying to be more and more, more so to address this more and more, more and more systematically now to make sure that everything is reproducible so that people can go back and really confirm what we have done. And again, it's much, it sounds much easier than it is in practice for an open research question where you change directions every day. Okay, I promised in the beginning I should talk about health and biodiversity, so I'll, I'll touch on that. Uh, and now uh, you should basically turn off the camera because now I'm going to ramble a little bit, but, but it's, it's fine. Um, so let's talk about health. So this is what Science Lab is doing, has been doing for a while and uh, through the clinical genomics platform now. So I'm now talking about Science Lab as a whole or the area as a whole, not only what we are doing in my team or so. Um, but if you have a kid born with a, with a metabolic inborn error, so it turns out after a week or so that the kid is really sick, uh, then we do take a blood sample. We re 
run it over to Scilab, put it on the machines, do whole genome sequencing. So we investigate the whole genome of the, of the kid, put it onto our, the, our service and, and, and our softwares. Uh, and basically through that, we are, in, in a lot of cases, we can actually nail down which of the, of the point mutations. So there's typically a point mutation happened in this kid, which leads to, the, to this illness. Uh, and that we can typically point out. And in some cases, we can also use that to direct the treatment. So this is fantastic development. And these, these kids uh, five or 10 years ago, they would, would normally die. So they would not make it. So it has a dramatic impact for these uh, newborns in this case. And it's, uh, well, I mean, Anna Vidal has been the driving force behind this together with Valtteri who's set up the uh, the infrastructure at Silent Lab. Uh, interestingly, this also generates a lot more data than what the hospital actually needs to do the inference. But uh, it's still most cost effective to do whole genome sequencing to get out all the information we need. But there's a lot of data generated that we could also use for research on this uh, if there are ethical permits and everything. So, Okay, today this is what's being set up. I mean, we have the hospitals where we do patient data, we take decisions of patients, we diagnose them, uh, and we have the, have the universities that are looking for novel insight and new methods and so on. And this is now trying to be connected through Genomics Medicine Sweden, which is a large initiative. It's not Scilaf Lab driven, but it's lots of people in common between Genomics Medicine Sweden and Scilaf Lab, including Richard Rosenquist, who's driving this, where uh, we're trying to bring these large-scale technologies into the hospitals in a way that we can also share them with research. And then, of course, you have to combine it to all these public resources that are out there and are growing immensely. Uh, so this is a large product that is ongoing. So this is kind of what's happening now. If you look a little bit ahead into the future, we could think about this. So the patient will probably go to the hospital sometimes and there will be large scale omics done and lots of data generated. They could as well go to a company, I think, that will start offering this. Why should they go to the hospital when Google will offer this cheaper um, or, or produce a better analysis? Uh, we have the, have the universities here. Through your smartphone, I mean, there's lots of information in your smartphone, right? Facebook knows every, everything about you and, and actually the, the activity. There are some studies showing that it's, you can actually, um, uh, you can actually uh, try, to, try to predict things like Alzheimer's by change behaviors on how you use your, your iPhone. Uh, so that's lots of interesting movement data in your phone also. Uh, we can look at home diagnostic devices. How many have a fever thermometer at home? Okay, almost everybody. How many, how many of your parents, you think, had a fever thermometer at home? Yeah, my parents too. How many has any other diagnostic device at home? What is it? You have a blood pressure, okay. So it's one more at least, because this is kind of annoying to me. How can we still only have a thermometer? I mean, there's so much more we can do here. Okay, never mind. Uh, so point being here that, that uh, that's gonna be tons of data that the individual might host themselves somehow. Or the question is at least who will host all this data? And how can it be integrated? Who, who has access and ownership of this data? And who has the right to interpret that data in terms of healthcare? I can see us ending up in, in a Facebook situation where the most interesting data when it comes to healthcare is not gonna be either at the hospitals or at the universities. It's gonna be private. Uh, do we like that? Is that where we wanna go? I don't know, but I think this is worth to think about. And it's gonna be enormous amounts of data. Okay, so that was that. Let's talk about biodiversity. Uh, this is a three tree, so it's a phylogenetic tree from Ernst Haeckel. Uh, and this is, as you see, a few hundred years back. It's surprisingly accurate, so trying to link different species together. He still had the idea that I mean, humans were at the top of the tree and the king of nature and so on, which I don't agree with. But, but apart from that, things were uh, surprisingly correct 200 years ago. Um, 
A more modern version of that is this. Uh, and you can see here that we have, if you talk about biodiversity, you have plants here that you probably know about, and you have fungi somewhere up there, and amoeba you probably heard about, but you know nothing about. Uh, and there's some, uh, then we have animals over here that is what you think is life. Uh, and then you have this big half over here where you've never heard of basically, unless you're biologists because you know this already. But, but these are basically single cell eukaryotic organisms. Uh, we know almost nothing about them. Uh, there's lots of genetics we don't understand. There's some really peculiar animals treating the, the genome in very funny ways. Uh, so that's what we call eukaryotes. And then, of course, eukaryotes in themselves are only about a third of all the biodiversity on the planet because most of the biodiversity is in bacteria and archaea. So here's the bacterial tree and the biodiversity compared to the eukaryotes and the archaea over here. Um, so there's a huge span of things out in nature that we don't understand and we know pretty little about. And up to about yesterday, we could not, there was no way we could interrogate this biodiversity because the only thing we could do was to take samples out in the water and put them on an, on an agar plate and some things grow, but most things died. And those things that died, we could never do anything with. So what we do now is basically taking this, uh, extract the DNA right out of the samples from everything and then we sequence it. And so this is technology called uh, I mean, so this is what we talk about as, as the metagenomics. So you have a complex sample of different stuff here, bacteria mainly. You chop it up into pieces. And then we have come up with pretty clever methods actually to put them together as bacteria. So we can actually tell which piece comes from what, in the, what uh, species, if you like to talk about species in bacteria, but never mind. Um, so these new technologies uh, have been developed the last years and now actually work pretty well. Uh, and so we can do things like that. This is what has been done already. You know, you take your big boat, you go out in the Baltic Sea, you take water samples, you go home to your lab and you sequence those. And then you can infer the composition of uh, uh, microbes in the Baltic Sea over, over time, over a yearly annual cycle, right? So that's interesting research. Uh, now, science matters. So we bring them home to the machines I just showed you. This is what they did for this study with the boats. Uh, but now there are smaller devices. This is actually a sequencer. So this sequencer you can, is, is essentially like a USB stick. You hook it up to your computer by, by a USB. Uh, and you can sequence on this. So you put your samples on here and in your computer up comes a sequence. And the way it works uh, is this. So now you can forget everything I talked about, about photos before. So here is the membrane, and in the membrane you put pores, and through these pores you can funnel the DNA. And as DNA is passing through the pore, the current over the membrane changes a little bit, and it changes depending on what nucleotide actually passes. This is science fiction. It's fantastic. So you, can, you, you get a film out here, so you get a real-time image about what is passing through the pore. And through that you can read out the sequence on DNA. This accidentally kind of also, uh, also allowed us to jump from, from the sort of 150 base pair reads I talked about up to about 2 million. And there is no real theoretical limit for how large pieces we can read now in one single piece. That's also a tremendous development. Uh, and of course now you can think about, you could with some extra technological development. I admit we're not quite there yet, but, but essentially you could, of course, put this out. So you put the sequencing machines out everywhere and, and you could do biosurveillance of everything. So this internet of things will, of course, to some extent be internet of bio things because you can put them out all over the Baltic Sea and you can continuously sequence what, what passes through, you could imagine, or you can detect water contaminants or bioterror people I mean, releasing stuff in the air and home diagnostic devices, we need to get them. I need to know why my kids are sick, not only that they vomit, right? I mean, what is it? Um, so there's gonna be continuous flows of data. It's gonna be super large volumes and it's gonna be noisy. We need computation to handle this. 
Okay, so that was it in a sense. So my take home is, you know, we are a key platform at Scilab Lab. Scilab Lab is not only data production, we also have a lot of competence when it comes to analyzing data. Uh, when it comes to computation, I think this field is still, it hasn't really sunk in to everybody how large this field is becoming and how much computational needs there actually are and how many interesting problems there are to handle this. Now the big dragons are starting to awake. Amazon and Google are starting to understand that this is uh, gonna be interesting. So they are having their own projects to approach biodata. Um, but, but also for research, I think there's lots of possibilities to go into this field and, and find your niche. There's a lot of things that can be done smarter or faster or better. Uh, and then I think bioinformatics competence is something that is important for the universities and we need to find a valid place for, for staff at the university for bioinformatics uh, and other expert areas I think also. Um, and I think this should be a strategic question for the universities, not, not just a problem for the research groups themselves. Right, and with that I will thank you. This is part of the team, so the platform now hosts about 60 to 70 people all over Sweden. Um, uh, according to VR, we are awesome, uh, so we must be, I guess, they are always right. Uh, and with that, I thank you so much and take any questions. Thank you. Right, I should just mention as we're recording the talk, we're recording the questions and the answers too. So if you have a question, please wait until you get a microphone so that everyone out there in YouTube land will also be able to hear your question as well as the answer. And I have two volunteers here, thank you, who are going to help pass the mics around. So, any questions? We have a question at the back. Thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, I'm myself working at CERN, so I, was, I, was, I enjoyed your comparisons with, with, with CERN all the time. Uh, and indeed, it's, um, th there are many similar aspects, but also there are some differences because, for example, I mean, basically, us, the, the CERN community in Sweden, it's a one, f basically, or two large groups. Mm -hmm. While in your case, there are probably very many small groups, right? Yes. And y you have, yeah, like you said, many rather small devices while we have one big. And then you own your data. We actually don't because it's a kind of a common ownership of the entire worldwide community, so we can't really, d I mean, we're not, like we, us here in, in our university, we're not the ones deciding on how to make it open, whatever. So, so the competence, competence needed is uh, kind of differently placed, so to say. Mm -hmm. So wh while the science is, of course, distributed, uh, the competence is very well pooled, so probably this kind of center will not apply uh, for our case. On the other hand, we actually, of course, we're also using SNCC for our mm -hmm. uh, needs, right? Mm -hmm. And again, here comes the difference. We actually own our resources. So we actually buy our, we get m money for our hardware, we just place it at SNCC, right? Okay. So SNCC just cares for it, uh, for, yep. for, for, for our hardware. But, well, you say actually you don't. So, uh, so you say you, you or, or uh, so do you so think this will work? So the hardware that we use in-house for pre-processing the data, that, that is owned by Scilab Lab uh, and placed at SNCC. So that's very similar to your case. Oh, okay. Uh, whereas uh, when the research groups analyze their data, that is counted as any research community in Sweden. And so they use SNCC resources paid by VR essentially and co-funding by the university. So you should basically apply for, for resource allocation there. Okay. So you apply for resource allocation uh, for, for the yes. analysis, right? Yes. So, so each individual mm -hmm. research group applying for resources. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, because that, that's that's different in our, in our case. Yeah. I mean, we, we also do apply for resource allocation, but that kind of, that's almost not necessary because, yeah. So, so uh, but do you think it will scale in future for the, for the Zettabytes data? Um, I or, don't or, know. I mean, or we will SNCC run out of resources? <laughs> so right now, we, it's, it's okay. Uh, but, uh, but apart from now, we've had a continuous crisis for the last 15 years, I think, in terms of data. and. Uh, uh, and gradually scaled up, uh, and I don't know. It's as simple as I think a lot of this setabyte is gonna be also clinical data, and so this is also a, a complicating factor in the sense that a lot of the data we're dealing with is sensitive human data, uh, and uh, it's how this will be distributed and shared between 
clinics and research is not clear at this point. We're just starting to discuss essentially how, how it can be done. And it's also hard to foresee how fast it will scale up. But, but there, there is, a, I just said also that uh, um, I know Gothenburg uh, region, so the hospitals in the Gothenburg region, they, they have invested, so they have a capacity. They don't sit on the data, but they have compute capacity for, for a system of 700 petabytes. But they will have to store data as well, I suppose. I mean, so they will have to have in-house uh, storage facilities. In yes, hospitals. exactly. That's, that's an in-house storage facility that they have invested in now. That's, and I mean, 700 petabytes is, is some data. I mean, that's, and they don't have that data at all, but they have the capacity to actually store that amount of data. So that's an indication of what they think will happen. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Victor down here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Victor. I, I work here. I'm uh, associate in lecture in systems biology. Mm -hmm. um, my question is related to your 100 projects. On yeah. um, do you follow these projects after you're done with your part? I mean, so it depends. His answer. So we have different tags. So if we, uh, I mean, sometimes we are contracted, and uh, and then typically on these. Uh, our rate, so when we have a fee-for-service track, and that is typically fairly uh, short parts of projects. And then it's almost impossible for us to follow them afterwards, to know exactly what happens to them. For the larger projects, then, then yes, we typically follow them until, until publication, essentially, until we can sort okay. of close and wrap up the whole project. And that means that we typically follow them for two, sometimes three years. Yes. Until you publish the Ant result. Until you publish the result, and then, then we are also, and yes. So that's one answer. Has it happened to start with a, so you, the guys come with to you with a biology question, and you went all the way, and then you have the answer. And <laughs> yes. what's the percentage of success? <laughs> <that>? Percentage <laughs> of su success. It's fairly high, but, but I mean, it might not be uh, the the fantastically. You know, high impact answer that they that they were aiming for, but but the percentage of success in the terms of we can take this data and we can uh, we can infer new knowledge from it. I mean, then it's pretty high, maybe eighty percent, ninety percent. I don't know, somewhere there. Okay. Uh, and and then of course we have some projects that completely fail. You know, it turns out the data is is not good enough, or other things happens, and, and we cannot do anything. One more question, and then I'm done. Yes, yes. Uh, the the data when when you you have the data, who owns the data? Is it the, the customer or so is it? So the research groups always owns the data. Okay, so you don't decide on the data at no, all. No, we don't decide, and Sinaf Lab uh, overall has no ownership of the data. So it's always the research groups that's who owns. Yeah. Okay. The thank you. Oh, we've got a couple more questions. We'll take Mano first then, please. Well, thank you very much for the thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I would uh, dis want to discuss a number of uh, issues in here, for example, about uh, incidental secondary findings. But we both know that there is no answer to that. I mean, how to do it and how to deal it. It's actually for the clinicians to do. But may I make a, a kind of a small announcement in here about local services in bioinformatics? Absolutely. So uh, I'm Mauno Vihinen, coming from the medical faculty, and I'm the head of the, our uh, local bioinformatics infrastructure called LUBI, LUBI LSGA, Lund University Bioinformatics Infrastructure for Large-Scale Genomics Analysis, which is for NGS data, data analysis. Uh, we have services, they are available on Lunark. You can find everything from our website. We just recently bought uh, dedicated computer plates for uh, bioinformatics. There's hardly no use at the moment, so if you, if you need uh, to do calculations, so there's plenty of time at the moment. Uh, these are currently available in the sort of open area. Next year, we are going to invest to the GDPR compliant uh, environment. 
and to provide services in there. And everything we provide is free for everybody at Lund University. This is local infrastructure. Okay. Sorry uh, for interfering with NBIS, no, but this is no completely... There's no interference at all. I think it's great that, that uh, there are complementary <laughs> initiatives. Yeah, it, this is completely complementary. We are not competing in any, any way, and uh, we are sending people to, to your people, I mean, to talk about with their, of, of their pro problems and so on. Uh, we have a, uh, a person who is taking care of uh, the systems administration for bioinformatics software, so you, so you can ask us to install things. But you have to do your research yourself. We don't do it, do it for you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mano. I think there was one last question at the back then. The microphone's inbound. Hi, um, I'm particularly interested in plant genomics, yeah. and I wanted to know what percentage of those talented people are there have skills in plant genomics, and how would you rank your Anbus uh, as like in in plant genomics expertise, and uh, what's your future plans to make 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 it better if it needs to be? Um, okay, uh, so so in plant genomics, I don't. I'm not. I'm not completely sure how to answer. I mean, since we most of our staff works on different model systems. So there's few people who are only dedicated to a certain uh, species group. Uh, so, so therefore, I'm a little bit hesitant. Uh, we could flip it around and say how many, how many of our, what percentage of our projects deals with plants. Uh, and I don't have a good number. Is it, it's not super huge. Probably somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. That range. We will. Uh, we, we we are starting up some big plant genomics projects uh, now soon-ish. Uh, but we have also worked with, uh, so you know, Tanja Slotte, for example, at Stockholm University, working on. Yeah, okay, never mind. Uh, but so, but that's been plant genomics and a little specific expression in plants in speciation questions, for example. Uh, so, so we have plant competence, and you're more than welcome with a plant question to come to us. Okay. Great. What, what specific plants so, are you? So um, I'm working uh, at LTH mm -hmm. in an industrial research center called Scanodes, mm -hmm. and we are sequencing the hexaploid oak oh. genome. Ah, right. And we've had to turn to experts in, yes. say, Germany who are, who are leading the Germany and France who have done a lot of the work for the wheat genome sequence and yeah. barley genome sequence yeah. sequencing projects. So we're kind of like learning from, from them and yes. trying to bring some of that expertise and knowledge to these two guys here. These are PhD students and, uh -huh. uh, and a bioinformatician. Yeah. So it would be great. Oh, it would be great to talk. I'm, I was, uh, I have known about the oat product for, for a long time. Uh, and, uh, so we'd like to work, tap into your, to your, to your expertise as well. Was that? We would like to tap in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I know we have, there have been contacts also about that, but for some reason it hasn't really materialized uh, I mean, a collaboration yet, but, but that could still happen. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're right now yes. looking at one genome, but then mm. uh, as everyone does in serial genomics, you've got to think about a pan genome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's sure. a whole other big monster to deal with. Yeah. No, but I'd be more than happy to, to discuss that with you. Yeah. Good. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you for the question. On that note, let's thank our speaker one more time, please.